Good morning. It is always such a pleasure to gather in celebration of our Posey Leadership Award winners every year. And I welcome you to this convocation honoring our 2016 Posey Leaders, uh, Leadership Award co-recipients, Mr. Nicholas Kristoff and Ms. Cheryl Wudun. Um, as you know, this award was established uh, by Lee and Sally Posey, the late Lee Posey, uh, to recognize individuals who've made a significant impact on the world through service and leadership. And it brings those individuals to campus to spend time with our students, our faculty, our staff, our friends in the community. We think this is so important because we know that an Austin College education gains its significance not from what it does to our individual students, but what it allows those students to do for the world. And when we gather in this spirit every year, we are reminding ourselves what it is that we value as, as an, a community of teachers and learners. We're reminding ourselves what Austin College's mission is in the larger world. And we're renewing our sense of purpose in living out that mission. These are very challenging times. I know that many of us um, are, all of us, are reaching out our hearts and our prayers to the people of Belgium uh, after learning this morning about the terrible events in Brussels. I know that we are still continuing to reach our thoughts and prayers out to the people in Turkey after the events in recent weeks in Ankara and Istanbul. I know that many of us uh, have woken up this morning to very sad news about a, f a family in our own community, and there is much mourning and concern for uh, those who loved that family. So we are gathering in a time when the spirit of hope means more and more to us. And part of what is so meaningful about the work that we'll hear about today is that it does keep hope alive. It's a model and an image of how we remember our commitment to repairing the world and our responsibility to sharing in that work together. Um, as president of the college, I try never to follow an Austin College student because they are always so tremendous. So I'm always pleased when the events of the day invite me to introduce a student. And I am about to do that. Um, and then he will introduce our speakers. Before I do that, I want to give a special shout out of appreciation to President Emeritus Oscar Page and his lovely wife, Anna Laura Page. Oscar, as you know, was uh, president when the vision for this award was hatched and the, worked so closely with his dear friend, Lee Posey, to make, it, to make it a reality. So it's lovely to see you both here. Andrew McMillan is a senior from Mount Bellevue, Texas. He is majoring in biology and minoring in art because that's how we roll at Austin College. Um, on campus, he's involved with the service station with the Students Today Alumni Tomorrow group. He also serves as a, the student representative on our uh, Austin College alumni board. Andrew has told me that his experiential learning opportunities as Austin College have led him to be passionate about service, leadership, and philanthropy. And recently, he served as a GO Fellow in Peru, where he helped uh, with jungle conservation. I have no doubt that he will be a fine example of a world changer in the years ahead. So please join me in welcoming uh, Austin College senior Andrew McMillan. Thank you, President Haas. It is an honor to introduce the founders of the Half the Sky Movement, Mr. Nicholas Kristoff and Ms. Cheryl Wudun, to you today. You can read a short biography on your program. However, there are a few highlights I would like to mention. When I first learned that these two were coming to Austin College, I was excited, excited for a couple of reasons. First, after reading their most recent book, their dedication to providing insight into the importance of giving was evident something that Austin College students experience firsthand during their career here, and something we can all learn more about. Second, this is a great opportunity for the Austin College community to listen to influential advocates firsthand on controversial topics like gender equality, human trafficking, and poverty. Christoph and Wu Dun have received numerous awards. Among those are the Pulitzer Prize they received as a team in 1990, and a second Pulitzer Prize in 2006 awarded to Christoph. 
more than the accolades they have won, is their extraordinary efforts in bringing the light um, to the issues of our global society that many of us would fail to acknowledge without the work of genuine advocates like Christoph and Wudun. Mr. Christoph is no stranger to bringing light into the darkest of topics. Such topics include opposition to the Iraq war, climate change, gender issues, global poverty, and global health. Through his writing ability, he raises awareness, voices his concerns, and provides powerful insight into how we might fulfill the promises of past generations. Ms. Wudun's intellectual and professional versatility has created a prestigious reputation. From working as a senior lecturer at Yale University's Jackson Institute for Global Affairs, to vice president in investment management at Goldman Sachs, to being an executive and a journalist with the New York Times. In all these roles, she is a proven, recognized, and influential leader. Now she uses her voice and talents to raise awareness for women empowerment, and also to discuss and create philanthropic strategies that will benefit similar world-changing organizations. Now, please join me in welcoming the 2016 Austin College Posey Leadership Award co-recipients and authors of A Path Appears, Transforming Lives, Creating Opportunity, Mr. Nicholas Kristoff and Ms. Cheryl Wudun. Thank you so much, Andrea. Of course, that was great. We're delighted to be here. I love the weather. Uh, I love the hospitality. We've had great time with um, uh, President Haas and her, her colleagues uh, yesterday and, and today, this morning. Uh, I'm still looking for the kangaroo. <laughs> um, well, I would like to start off with a thought experiment. I know you all are very good at thought experiments. So what if there were a drug that would allow you to be happier, be a better person, and maybe live a little bit longer with no side effects? Would you take it? Why wouldn't you take it, right? Well, we all uh, want to also find a path in life. We want to find meaning in life. What would you do with that extra bit of life, that extra length of life? Well, you could continue as you are doing now. You could you know, pursue more studies, uh, uh, maybe do graduate school, graduate work for, 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 you, for you students. You could continue with your career and the status quo. Is that really meaningful? Is that really worth the extra bit of life that you might uh, take on? Suppose uh, that because you're given a little bit of superhuman uh, qualities, you might think about taking on some superhuman problems. What kind of problems would those be? Uh, well, uh, one problem that seems to have surfaced in this election, thanks to Bernie Sanders, is the problem of inequality, growing inequality. And yes, it is true um, that um, uh, inequality is a big, big problem. Uh, actually, let me show you a slide we have that has some statistics, though some of you may already be very aware of them, right? So the richest 85 people on Earth actually own about as much as the bottom 50% of humanity. Uh, in the US, the top 1% owns about uh, the, as much as the 90% at the bottom. Those are pretty stunning figures. But you know what? Even more than the inequality of income, the inequality of wealth, really is the inequality of opportunity. It's the lack of opportunity that really is the key here. In fact, polls show uh, that 97% of Americans believe that every American should have an equal opportunity to lift themselves and, uh, and have a great standard of living. 97%. That's probably more people than believe that the Earth is round. A big number, really impressive. Well, so how do you distribute, how do you give uh, opportunity? How do you improve uh, uh, opportunity? There's been a revolution in research uh, that is focusing more on data-driven, evidence-based research. And those of you who are professors here, you know that this uh, revolution is taking place. A lot of this research is pointed to the types of things that work and the types of things that don't work, especially in the world of uh, helping others, giving back, and uh, in development, the world of development. What it is showing is that we actually have to intervene earlier than we have been. 
So, so many of our policies, our actions to help others, to help those who are, are less privileged, who are impoverished, fail because we intervene too late. Uh, and so how early do I mean? Well, really early. Um, the first thousand days of life, in fact. How many of you students here are pre-med? Raise your hand. OK, I know there are a lot of you, uh, who maybe some of you don't want to admit it. Uh, um, but at least you're taking biology, probably, right? So you'll know a lot about what I'm going to talk about next. Let me show you something. You haven't eaten lunch yet. <laughs> so this is, yes, some rats. And um, they actually hold the key to some of the solutions. Uh, there was a Canadian scientist named Michael Meany, and he noticed that there were some mother rats who licked and cuddled and hugged their baby rats. And there were other um, mother rats who didn't, who were, so to speak, more paws off. And so he wondered if there was a difference between the rats uh, who grew up with the attentive mothers and those with less attentive mothers. And it turned out that there was. In fact, it looked as though the rats who grew up with uh, mothers who licked and cuddled and hugged them turned out to be sort of better in many different ways, um, not the least of which is that they are better at mazes. You actually can test the intelligence of rats. Um, so then he decided, well, I got to make sure that this is not biological. So he switched the baby rats at birth, and he gave you know, these rats to the uh, less attentive moms and these rats to the attentive moms. And sure enough, it wasn't biological. It was the licking, the cuddling, and the hugging that really made the difference. Well, it's true of humans as well. Actually, this photo was so much easier to find. You know, hugging you know, humans is very easier, much easier to find than hugging rats. <laughs> um, so actually, but it's true that for humans, uh, you have to lick your babies. <laughs> um, well, licking your babies, hugging your babies, kissing your babies, that is really important. Uh, it, it turns out that that's a much stronger, it's, we call it maternal attachment, and it's a much stronger um, nurturing uh, force than we ever imagined. In fact, at the age of three and a half, uh, how much maternal attachment uh, you've had is a better predictor of your high school graduation, your, your graduating from high school, than your IQ at three and a half. So it's really quite, quite stunning. So clearly, all of you students here have been licked and cuddled and hugged. Right? <laughs> Um, so what's really going on here? And some of you know from all the biology that you've been studying that there is a great deal going on in the brain in the first thousand days of life. Uh, in fact, um, what's happening is the brain is growing at its fastest pace during that time than ever uh, uh, later on. I mean, your brain at that age from zero, you know, maybe up to five years old, is growing at the fastest pace that it ever will grow. Many of you students, your brains are still growing, of course, but not as fast as those of, of babies. So when a baby cries, when a baby is not being fed, when the diaper's wet and no one changes it, when they're just being left alone to cry, what's happening is that the baby is under toxic stress. Um, I mean, stress, we all face stress. We all have cortisol coursing through our brain. But what's happening now is that the cortisol is, is bathing the baby's brain. It's like a bath of cortisol. And that's when uh, impairment of brain development starts taking place. It's called toxic, it's toxic stress. Uh, and it really has a major impact. It can have a major impact. Uh, and you know, they've actually looked at uh, the brains and they see that at times if, if the baby's uh, uh, cortisol is really uh, impairing the brain development, it could uh, uh, really hurt the development of the hi hippocampus. Uh, it can grow to be, or grow more slowly, it could be asymmetrical. And it also has, it can impair the development of the prefrontal cortex, which is really important for impulse control. So what we're really talking about, I mentioned earlier the, the opportunity gap, gap and opportunity. This is really uh, an 
a gap in parenting because it does come down to the real close environment in which the baby is growing up. Uh, it's a parenting gap, and it's really hard to talk about. Uh, we don't like talking about the gap in parenting. We think that's something personal. It's, you know, no one else should interfere. But it, it also is a problem. Uh, research uh, has shown that there is a difference in approach uh, of parenting. So for instance, if you're middle class or upper class, the baby is going to get all these enrichment classes. It's going to be taken from music lessons to piano lessons to, you know, to soccer lessons. Um, but that's not necessarily the case in a lower income family. And also the way, uh, the philosophy of raising kids. In some cases, we know that in a uh, middle class, upper class household, uh, that when a kid cries, parents rush to it um, or adults rush to it. Um, and this is not always the case in uh, lower income, but the research has shown that there are many cases where the parents think, I want my kid to grow up self-reliant. If I run to the baby when it cries, I'm gonna spoil that baby. So, you know, if I let it alone, uh, it'll learn self-reliance. Actually, the science shows that that's not the case. In fact, one, neuroscience said, no, one neuroscientist said that growing up poor is bad for your brain. Uh, so there are ways that we do need to um, uh, uh, communicate uh, this, this message. How do, we, how do we find out about this? How do we sort of really understand that, that, that those early years are so important in brain development? Well, let me take you back to uh, the fall of the Romanian uh, regime uh, uh, when communism sort of was collapsed in Romania in 1989. What happened was uh, that they found all these orphanages with lots of orphans in them. And yes, these orphans, they got food, they got water, but they really got very little human contact. Uh, and so they had a chance to do an experiment. They looked at uh, 68 orphans uh, who were removed and placed in foster homes, and they looked at 68 who were left. They left 68 of them in the orphanage to look at the differences. It turns out that what mattered was not only removal of these kids uh, from the orphanage and placing them into foster homes, but how early they were removed. So the children who were removed before the age of two did fine. They were able to grow up, lead independent lives, they were able to fend for themselves. The kids who were removed after the age of two, age of two they didn't do so well. In fact, uh, their IQ remained stuck in the 70s. Uh, they did scans of their brains and they saw that there was less brain activity, there was less gray matter, uh, and in some cases, the brain structures had actually sort of were kind of shrunken. So it was really remarkable uh, to learn that this window, there is a window between the age of zero to two, and it starts to close after that. So what happens if you've missed that window? Well, you know, luckily here uh, in, the, in the US, uh, you know, we don't have too many people missing that window, but uh, if, that window is missed. There are other uh, stages where intervention is very successful as well, but the odds are just a little bit um, harder. So for instance, elementary school, high school, those are other times when it's really uh, can be very successful. Let me tell you the story of Khadija Williams. She is a girl who grew up in Los Angeles with her sister and her mother. She lived in homeless shelters, moved from home to home to home. Uh, homeless shelter. She really only went to third grade and fourth grade. Um, she missed most of fifth, fifth grade. She went to part of sixth grade, um, a little bit of seventh grade, and two weeks of eighth grade. By the time she got to high school, she was determined to stay put. And she also was very determined to learn, to get an education. So every time she got a chance, she would read a paper, that so, a newspaper that someone had thrown away. She tried to get advice and help from her, 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 her teachers. Uh, she took advantage of any tutoring, any free tutoring. Uh, and she would also, uh, living in a homeless shelter, 
she would kind of try and tidy herself up so she would look presentable and, and wouldn't smell so much in class. Um, she, there were mentoring programs at her high school, but it also meant because she was living in a homeless shelter, she would have to get up at 4 a.m., take buses uh, to uh, her high school. She would stay there all day, uh, do after school clubs, get whatever tutoring she could. She did track and field, she did the chess club, debate club, and then she would get back home at 11 p.m., and the next day she would do it all over again. People knew that she was going places because she was so determined. She had a lot of help, though. So there was Central Scholars program there, there was uh, you know, uh, Upward Bound, uh, there was a generous couple, Jim and Pat London, who really took a liking to her. So Khadija, of course, uh, was encouraged to apply to college. But this is where she does her homework, you know, on the streets. And she was gonna write her essay on the streets. Uh, her, you, we all know how hard it is to get into college and all the essays that you have to write. And so Jim and Pat London, when she was in her, uh, the fall of her senior year, uh, when they uh, saw that she uh, was really, uh, you know, uh, intent on applying to colleges, they said to her, uh, Khadija, a homeless shelter is no place for you to write your college applications. So why don't you come into our home and we will uh, give you a calm environment so that you can write uh, proper applications. So Khadija wrote very powerfully about her, her growing up in homeless shelters and her struggle to, to get an education. And so two years ago, uh, Khadija, she graduated from Harvard College. And actually, um, she got a shout out at her graduation from Oprah Winfrey, uh, who really recognized what it took for someone like Khadija uh, to uh, get through. I mean, Khadija certainly has a lot of grit, determination, and I know that there are a number of you who have that kind of grit and determination because it's taken that for you to get to Austin College. So really, I, um, I salute you uh, because the grit and deter determination is going to get you places. So keep that um, and as you go forward. But also recognize that all of us can be a Jim and Pat London. We can all help someone who's, who's um, struggling. And if, in fact, when Khadija got to college, it was her, f she struggled through, through college as well. Um, I mean, thankfully it was the first time she had her own room, but it was hard. She was in a different environment. She didn't, there were so many students who had grown up with everything and she had nothing and, and the, the work was hard and, and she was struggling. And she leaned on a lot of friends and a lot of um, other people who helped her along the way. Uh, so we all can be those kind of helping hands. It isn't just the kind of um, uh, challenge that we have here at home. Uh, and a uh, helping hand is also something that we, we here as Americans uh, can help people, um, certainly within our own community, but also overseas. And it may seem as though, wow, you know, how do you um, do anything to help someone overseas? Where do you start? Well, um, I think it does seem like such a far away problem, but when you see the results, the potential results, it really can be quite gratifying. And so helping others can do wonders for a particular individual. And if you focus on that individual, you'll see how transformative it can be. So I wanna show you an example of one girl who was helped uh, by some uh, you know, donations here that helped bring her to a school for girls uh, in Nairobi. She was born and raised in a, and she is still being raised, in one of the worst slums uh, uh, in, in Nairobi, in Kenya. So let me show you Eunice. Eunice Sakoth presents my dream. Welcome. I have a dream. A dream that will never fail. Every mighty king was once a crime baby. Every great tree was once a tiny seed. And so is my dream. This journey seems so long. Yet, I will not waver. The path has turned all over. But I will not give up. Every day of my life is a page of my history. Every step that I take is a move to my glorious destiny. It's not where I am, but where I'm going that matters. Now listen. Listen carefully to 
the words of wisdom. Stop watching your dreams go down the drain. Fight, fight, fearlessly, like a wounded lion. For it's not about who you are, but how you see yourself. So, dream! Thanks. Uh, now my turn. Uh, um, and I should say that it's also a special treat for Cheryl and us to be here, not only because it, there is snow in New York right now, um, but also because we rarely have had the chance to travel together because we had, um, um, we had three kids at home. Uh, and if we had traveled together to give a talk, our home would have been the scene of the wildest party in New York State. <laughs> Um, but uh, we are now, as of this academic year, empty nesters. Our baby graduated from high school last June, and um, so it's great to be traveling together and, uh, you know, without concerns about what's happening back home. <laughs> um, and also, we're really glad to be here because we admire what Austin College has done in terms of the experiential learning, both the uh, practical learning opportunities, the internships, this kind of thing, in the, in the local area, uh, and also the opportunities to travel abroad. Uh, that was something that was really transformational for me, also for Cheryl. Um, Andrew was in Peru, uh, and you know, likewise, I hope that those of you who are still going to have opportunities down the road to study or travel abroad in your time at Austin College will try to get out of your comfort zone and will really challenge uh, yourself uh, in in, in ways that uh, may perhaps give your parents gray hairs, but that is what undergraduate experience is for, uh, and that's the best way to do that. Um, um, Cheryl was talking about what, in essence, is kind of a revolution in engaging and giving back and making a difference and making it accessible to uh, a lot more people. And while we really admire what you students at Austin College are doing in terms of that kind of engagement, we'd also like to challenge you to, to raise it even one notch higher. And there are new ways of having an impact, uh, of finding a chance to, to leverage one's interests and abilities at home or abroad, integrate, it's giving back in daily life. Um, one, one example uh, it was very close to uh, to home. Uh, a few years ago, I got the best Father's Day present ever from my kids, and I commend it to you. It wasn't another necktie or, you know, who knows what. It, let me show you a picture of my, of my best Father's Day present ever. <laughs> this is a giant Gambian pouched rat. This is the, this is the he-man of rats. Um, this is a rat that is almost three feet long, nose to tail, three feet long. Um, I've released a few in the audience so you can sort of take a look at them firsthand, okay? <laughs> um, but they're, what's neat about them has to do with the fact that they are almost blind, but compensate with an excellent sense of smell. And so they are being trained for purposes that involve um, scent detection, in particular, for to be mine detectors, landmine detectors in the developing world. They can walk across a minefield and they're too light to set off a, a landmine, uh, but they can smell them out very, very effectively. And one of the problems with landmine detection, aside from the fact that it's dangerous, is that uh, normally it's done with a metal detector. And the places that tend to have landmines also tend to have a lot of scrap metal, usually empty uh, bullet shells. And so it's a pain. Every time you find a bit of metal, you have to take a, a very light brush and brush away the soil. It's a very painstaking, slow process. So a human landmine detector can, at considerable peril, clear about 20 square meters of land in a day, of a minefield in a day. Um, and so, but a, a rat can uh, clear about 250 square meters of minefield a day. Um, and uh, so the rat that my kids gave me as a Father's Day present, I didn't actually get physical possession of it, <laughs> but it was donated in my name uh, to, uh, through an NGO called Apopo, 
that uh, trains them to be my detectors. And last year I went and visited uh, my rat uh, in, uh, in Angola, uh, clearing mines. And I've got to say, my rat is the best mine detector out there. Uh, my rat works for bananas. Uh, and um, it was an example of, a, uh, of innovation um, and also of kind of integrating these steps into, into daily life. Um, beyond innovation, I think another element of this revolution is a growing focus not just on good intentions, but also on impact and measurement. I think borrowing a good deal from the business world about um, bringing rigor to the world of philanthropy or, uh, or, or the world of making a difference. And, so increasingly, we're measuring the uh, interventions that we do as if they were pharmaceutical double-blind trials and giving us a much better sense of what works at what cost. And we're learning all kinds of things when you do that. Uh, for example, I mean, those of you who read my column, you know that one of the things that I profoundly believe in is the impact of education as a way of transforming lives around the world especially getting more girls in school in the developing world. But we tend to think that the way you get more kids in school is just by building schools. And in fact, there are other ways that are a lot more cost effective to get that marginal child into a uh, school system. Um, and one study in Kenya, in fact, found um, uh, that uh, one, one intervention was 100 times more cost effective than, than building schools. Um, any guesses? Uh, about anybody who hasn't read a path of peers, any guesses about what that might be? It's a, it's a medicine that might well be found in a bunch of your homes, but that probably none of you, or very, very few of you have ever taken. How's that for a riddle? Any guesses about what that might be? It's a medicine, if it is in your homes, is probably not intended for human consumption. Here's a hint. Um, here's a really big hint. It might be intended for your dog or cat. Deworming medicine. You know, we don't think about deworming medicine because we don't have intestinal parasites. Actually, a hundred years ago, the Rockefeller Foundation dewormed American kids and had this incredible ab effect on the ability of American kids to study. Because if you've got worms in your gut, then A, nutrition isn't so much going to you, it's going to the parasites and you're more anemic, you're less able to concentrate, you're, you get sick more, you miss school, and this can be resolved really easily with one uh, very cheap pill of a, of a deworming drug, albendazole. And so this is what the metrics look like of getting one more child in school in Kenya. Um, and it's, this is just one small example of the way we can learn about how to make a difference, uh, both uh, abroad and at home. Domestically, it turns out that one of the, the most cost-effective ways of breaking cycles of, of poverty um, has to do with something that um, kind of doesn't naturally break in a conservative liberal uh, dichotomy that we have. Uh, it, it goes to a uh, conservative diagnosis, uh, which is that family structure is really important. And it, uh, especially for, for boys, for reasons we don't entirely know, we don't entirely understand, but uh, for uh, boys growing up in a home uh, without a male role model, uh, without somebody, a, a dad uh, at home or somebody else who can play that role, then it's sometimes more of an uphill struggle. And while that diagnosis is largely right. The traditionally conservative ways of addressing that problem of family breakdown have been tested and found largely ineffective. Uh, things like counseling, uh, encouraging uh, young men and women to marry, marriage promotion essentially doesn't work. One thing turns out to be quite effective and that has to do with uh, people your age and actually a little bit younger has to do with the fact that uh, in the U.S., as far as we can tell through surveys, American kids have sex at about the same rates 
as European kids, but have babies three times as often. And uh, when a, you know, when a 16 or 17 year old girl has a baby, the outcomes aren't great for that child, they're also not great for her. And she is much less likely later on to end up in a, in a marriage or a stable relationship. Well, why are American rates so problematic? There's less access to comprehensive sex education, less access to, to long-acting, reliable contraceptives. And when one, uh, there have been a number of experiments that show that where you provide teenagers or young women with reliable forms of contraception, then it uh, dramatically reduces uh, uh, pregnancies, births, and abortions, and saves public money seven times over. Because uh, having a, uh, when, when a, when a child has a, a baby, that's expensive for everyone as well. And um, so the way that really does seem to work to, to encourage uh, stronger families uh, seems to be uh, to uh, a combination of comprehensive sex education for young people and uh, making sure that young women who don't want to get pregnant have access to reliable forms of, of contraceptive, uh, contraception. Um, another, and then there are issues at home and abroad where we don't have the same rigor uh, of analysis, but we're increasingly getting evidence about what seems to work uh, getting better tools to address them. One of the issues that you may know that uh, Cheryl and I have written a lot about that we're very passionate about is human trafficking. Um, and to me, this really is truly a, a modern form of slavery at its extreme. Um, my own interest in this came about pretty much by accident. Back in the 1990s, I did one article, I thought it was going to be one article about uh, children being sold for sex in Asia, and I found uh, some very young girls in Cambodia, uh, 10, 11 years old, who were being imprisoned and were being auctioned off for their virginity. And I just couldn't believe it. I just couldn't believe this was going on. And, uh, you know, if these kids had tried to escape, the police would have handed them right back to, to, the, to the brothel owners. Um, so I kept on reporting on it. In 2004, I raised a lot of eyebrows journalistically by buying two girls from their brothels in Cambodia. And I got written receipts. When you get a written receipt for buying a human being in the 21st century, something is truly profoundly wrong. And then, uh, worked with a aid group in Cambodia to, to try to uh, um, resettle them, which is a, a long story we tell in Half the Sky. But that kind of haunted us. And so then we, began, we became curious about the situation here in the US with trafficking. And at the end of the day, the brutality of human trafficking domestically is sometimes not as great as it is abroad. And the scale of it is probably not as great as it is in some countries, but at the end of the day, we don't have the moral authority to tell other countries to clean up their act as long as we're making almost no effort to address this right here at home. And it is a huge problem. Um, the, there are tens of thousands of American kids who are trafficked each year into uh, the trade. and. Um, the, the, often we tend to think this is largely about foreign women smuggled into the U.S. No, that's a real problem, but the biggest part of the problem is domestic girls. Uh, th this is a um, uh, uh, young woman, Shauna Goodwin, who we've uh, come to know. She escaped it. These are some of her uh, mug photos. But uh, Shauna was trafficked at age 12. Um, and one indication of how the system didn't respond right was she was arrested 158 times, 158 times, and her pimp never, her pimp never 
Well, as long as we treat the victims of trafficking as criminals and we don't go after uh, the pimps, then this is going to continue. And there's also some evidence that if we uh, go after customers, after Johns, then that uh, reduces demand and that fundamentally this is a demand-driven business rather than a supply-driven one. So th there have been some experiments in other countries, uh, in Cebu, the Philippines, uh, underage trafficking uh, was almost 100% eliminated um, by making pimps pay a price, making it risky to be trafficking underage girls. We can do the same here. They can do that in, in Cebu, we can do that here. Um, and sometimes, you know, we wonder why it is when there are increasingly uh, studies and evidence about things that seem to work to address social problems around us, to create the opportunity that Cheryl talked about, and yet we don't uh, address them then. You know, what, what went wrong? What happened? And I think part of the answer to that is not so much that we just don't have the tools, but is what might be called an empathy gap. What do I mean by an empathy gap? Um, one way of looking at it is that in the US now, um, somewhat surprisingly, the top 20% of Americans uh, by income actually donate less to charity as a percentage of incomes than the bottom 20% of Americans, which doesn't make any intuitive sense. Uh, affluent Americans are no uh, no less sympathetic, no less good than anybody else. It, and the answer why that happens seems to be because if you are affluent in America today, then to a degree that was not true a generation ago, you're also insulated from need. More and more you live in a reasonably affluent neighborhood, you're more likely to uh, have colleagues and friends who are also reasonably affluent. And so you're intellectually aware of need, but it's not something you encounter every day. In contrast, if you are poor in America today, then every day you encounter people needier than yourself. And confronted by that, you respond, you reach out. And so I think one of the, the perils of being as successful as I think all of you are going to be is that you may be insulated from needs. And I think it's so important to try to always preserve ways of building that empathy, building those bridges, making those connections, so that we're not spending our lives in cocoons uh, and that we overcome that. And one of the, one of the, the perils of this insulation uh, is that we can also come up with narratives in which poverty and need are all about personal irresponsibility and bad choices. And, you know, let's be blunt. Bad choices are a real issue. There's no doubt that they compound disadvantage. But there's also no doubt that often the flow is from poverty toward bad choices rather than the other way around. And there's also no doubt that as long as we're talking about irresponsibility, then we also have to have a conversation about to what extent we, as a nation, we as a society are unwilling to make investments that will empower people, provide broader opportunity, and even save public money uh, at the same time, and yet we don't make those investments. That's a social irresponsibility that we also have to engage with. And when one is willing to bridge that empathy gap, then, you know, it's sometimes remarkable what can happen. Uh, one of, um, uh, there's, one story we tell in A Path of Tears that sort of underscores that. It's a um, kid growing up in rural Arkansas, an African-American kid going to a segregated black school in the late 1950s. His name is Ollie Neal, really smart kid, but also just a troublemaker. Um, kind of a jerk, frankly, to his teachers. He reduces the school librarian, Mrs. Grady, to tears. and. Um, uh, Ali is, uh, he's fired from his job at a local shop for shoplifting. Uh, he's, he's going nowhere in school. And then one day in 1957, he's uh, skipping English class and he's in this little library that Mrs. Grady has, has, has made. 
Um, and he just happens to, this book catches his eye, this young adult novel by an African-American author named Frank Yerby. Uh, actually, Ollie says that the reason this novel catches his eye is that the cover shows this, um, this woman, with this, this very voluptuous woman with this very risque top. And, um, uh, and I've always wondered about that because this is the 1950s, and what does a risque top even mean in 1950s terms, you know? Uh, but it caught his eye, and so he, he was looking at it. He thought, maybe it would be kind of fun to read this. But then he looked over at the, there's, there's a girl at the door, at, uh, a classmate who's supposed to be checking out books, and he can't be seen checking out a book. You know, tough kids don't read books. So he just puts it in his jacket and walks out. He steals the book. Well, it turns out to be a, a really great page turner. He reads it at home, and it's the first time he's really read a read fiction for pleasure, and he, he really enjoys it. So he returns it a week later, puts it back on the shelf in its spot, and he notices there's another novel by Frank Irby. So he steals that one. <laughs> and again, he reads it at home. It's a great read. He really enjoys it. Uh, eventually returns it, finds a third Frank Irby novel, steals that. And this happens four times. It turns Ollie Neal into a reader. And from that, he graduates to more sophisticated reading. He ends up going from this segregated, third-rate black segregated school uh, to college. From college, where he excels, he goes on to law school, becomes one of Arkansas's first African-American lawyers, a leader in the civil rights movement, a, a prosecutor, a judge. Um, here is, uh, here we go. Uh, oh. uh, here is Judge Ollie Neal. Um, and throughout his career, he's dedicated to helping disadvantaged kids like the one that he had once been. And so he goes back to a high school reunion and sits down with Mrs. Grady and says, Mrs. Grady, you know, it's your little library that completely turned my life around. But I got a confession. I stole some of your books. And Mrs. Grady says, well, Ollie, I have a confession, too. I saw you steal that first book. <laughs> and she says she'd been really indignant, you know. What is this jerk of a kid doing now, stealing books? And she was about ready to go and confront him and yell at him. And then in this flash of empathy, she understood that he was embarrassed to be seen reading a book. And so even though he's an obnoxious kid who had made her cry, in hopes that the book would touch him in some way, that he might want more, that it might be a way to leverage his potential, that weekend, she drove 70 miles to Memphis to the used bookstores there to try to find another book by Frank Irby. The first bookstore didn't have one. The second didn't have one. Mrs. Grady can't remember if it's the third or the fourth bookstore that did. She found one. She bought it with her own dime, drove back 70 miles, put it on the shelf, and when Ollie Neal stole that second Frank Gerby novel, she was thrilled. <laughs> and then she did this two more times. And you know, um, anybody who has engaged in this, these kind of efforts knows that helping people is harder than it looks. And it doesn't always pay off. And you, you take a risk on people, and sometimes it just leaves you with your heart broken. But every now and then, if you're willing to try to bridge that empathy gap and take a risk on people and not just condemn them, then every now and then it can have this transformative impact, not just on them, but also ripple through them in the lives of other people as well. Now, Cheryl talked at the beginning about, you know, what if there was a, a drug that could make us happier and live longer and so on. You know, what she was talking about was indeed this kind of engagement with the world around us, sort of pro-social engagement, trying to help others. And there's abundant evidence that there is something to the idea of finding fulfillment and meaning and purpose, and that this does bring real physiological health benefits. Uh, this uh, makes one live longer. One, one study looked at um, senior citizens and found that those who joined a uh, church or religious organization, went regulated regulate religious services, uh, that uh, they had, in any given year, they had a 29% reduced mortality risk. Those who exercised regularly had a 30% uh, diminished uh, mortality risk. Uh, those who volunteered for two or more organizations to try to make a difference, try to find that purpose, their mortality risk in any one year uh, dropped 44%. And 
you know, just imagine what happens if you join a, uh, like a religious running organization. You, know, you live forever. <laughs> um, the, um, I think one reason we sometimes don't engage is a sense that anything we do is going to be a drop in the bucket. These problems are huge, whether they're abroad or at home. What can we realistically do? We're not going to solve these problems. You saw that incredible video of Eunice. Yes, people managed to help Eunice, and they will transform her outcomes. There are still 62 million girls worldwide who should be in school in Orange. We're not going to solve that problem in this room. We're not going to solve that problem at Austin College or in Texas or in the US. These are big problems. In that sense, it is a drop in the bucket. But I'm also a believer in drops in the bucket. And I'm a believer in, in drops in the bucket, uh, partly uh, because of uh, this person, Vladislav Štipovic, a World War II uh, refugee uh, from Eastern Europe. Uh, he fled uh, Romania, was in a concentration camp for a while in Yugoslavia, um, almost executed, uh, made his uh, way eventually to France, couldn't get a work permit in France, and also just thought that, that France wasn't fully accepting of immigrants, and that neither he nor his yet unborn children would ever truly be, be fully accepted and get every opportunity. And so he began to think about how he might be able to come to the US. Um, he explored every kind of opportunity. He looked into a fake marriage with an American woman, and that seemed to be working right for a while, and then it, uh, that, that fell through. But he was cleaning hotel rooms illegally in Paris without a work permit, and one of the rooms he was cleaning happened to belong to a young American woman who was working uh, for the Marshall Plan. And she liked him, she admired him, and she convinced her parents back in Portland, Oregon, to sponsor his way to come to the US. They and their, and their church, actually the First Presbyterian Church of Portland, Oregon. Uh, um, so bravo to the Presbyterians. Uh, <laughs> And um, so, uh, you know, they had never met him. They didn't know anything really about him. But they sponsored his way to come to, to the US. And this didn't solve the global refugee problem, didn't make a dent in the global refugee problem. It truly was the proverbial drop in the bucket. But it was also completely transformative for him. Um, Vladislav Shostakovich came to the US. He began to learn English. And then he quickly realized that his name was totally unworkable in the US. Kristofovich had three Zs. Uh, so he shortened it to Kristoff. It's my dad. So take it from me, drops in the bucket. That is how you fill buckets. Thank you very much for having us here. I, th I think you can hear by the warmth of that applause that this was extremely inspiring for our community. Um, and we're just so grateful for you to bring this message to us and, and throughout the world. Um, we have a, a gift for you, and I'd like to invite uh, our student body president, Andrew Didasco, to come forward. Andrew is a uh, junior from Irving, Texas, and majoring in biology. He has served as a leader for our freshman seminar, which we call CI, or Communication Inquiry. He's also a member of Students Today alumni tomorrow. And he is passionate about social justice, and it was very excited to meet you. Please welcome Andrew and his gift. Thank you, Andrew. On behalf of the students of Austin College, thank you so much for everything that you do. We hope from the bottom of our hearts that you appreciate this gift from the Global Rouge. Wow. Thank you very much. <laughs>